There's a, a great panel we have this evening. We have John Choi from Crofi here um, to talk to us and also Phil Coxall from McGregor Coxall. Um, we have our fabulous moderators that you all know, Bob Nation and Stephen Varity. I'll hand over to Stephen now, who will introduce for you. Thank you, Darlene, um, and thank you everyone for turning up tonight. Welcome to Double Talk number 17. Can you believe it? It's now over a year since we started this architecture talk series and we're extremely pleased with how it has grown and how successful it has become. This is our final talk in Perth for this year, but we will definitely be back, even bigger and better in 2017. Now to our speakers, John Choi from Crofee in Sydney and Philip Coxall from McGregor Coxall, also based in Sydney. Philip Coxall was raised in the western suburbs of Sydney. He completed horticulture at Ryde before travelling and working overseas for seven years. Philip returned to Australia and studied landscape architecture in Canberra and then went off to work overseas for 10 years in England and then in Asia. During that time, he also completed a solo bicycle ride from France to Gambia in West Africa. After having studied landscape architecture together at the University of Canberra in the mid-1980s, Philip Coxall eventually joined Adrian McGregor in 2000 to form McGregor Coxall. McGregor Coxall are urban designers and landscape architects, recognised at both a national and international level for their innovative, environmentally based design solutions. In 2009, McGregor Coxall were awarded the German-based Topos International Practice of the Year Award, the first non-European practice to receive it. Well done. Philip has more than 26 years international experience in landscape architecture, urban design and planning. His expertise lies in leading and managing the design of large scale complex projects from concept to the resolution of the final details and then overseeing their construction and contract administration on site. He's undertaken this role for many of their leading projects including Ballast Point Park in Birch Grove in Sydney and the former BP site also located in Sydney Harbour at Wayford. Some other notable projects Philip has been involved in includes the Bayes Waterfront Promenade in Piermont, Walsh Bay Arts Precinct in Sydney, the General and Caves Master Plan, White Bay Power Station Urban Design Services, Quien Hai Gu Wan Park in Shenzhen, China. <laughs> I thought you were Chinese, that was I'm sure Bob, Bob would do it better. <laughs> Lizard Log Parklands, was that good? Yeah. <laughs> in Western Sydney, Blacktown Showgrounds in Sydney, the Calyx in the Royal Botanical Garden, Sydney, along with the important National Conservatory in the Australian National Botanic Gardens in Canberra, competition winning entry announced barely two weeks ago, something like that, and designed together with John and Crofi. Just finally, in 2010, Philip's work was recognised by the Sydney Morning Herald, where he was identified as one of Sydney's most influential professionals in improving the quality of life in Sydney. Please welcome Philip Coxley. That was a nice introduction. Sit down now, mate. I'm going to try and keep to the time frame, so I'm going to set my watch here. <laughs> there we go. Okay, it's ticking. So we've got 35 minutes. Look, thanks very much for having us, and thanks very much, Steve, for the introduction. It's, it's been a great to be here. I was in Perth uh, probably when I was about 22, hay carting, um, and now I'm back here in a suit. That's really impressive. <laughs> um, the, the talk I'm going to give tonight is a little bit self-indulgent and I really hope you forgive me but I know you're all designers and it, 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 it may be as you go through it you might see a little bit of your own journey in that and, and I'm fascinated by the process of design and how we get to where we, where we get to uh, where we are now, you know. So I'd like to take on a little bit of a journey, my own personal journey. And before I start on that journey I just need to tell you a little bit, um, Steve introduced me, I came from Western Suburbs. Our background is everything to us, I think, in a lot of ways. You know, that's the DNA that we bring to the whole thought process. 
I come from a family of five kids. Dad's uh, worked in a factory fitter in Turner. Um, all in Western Sydney. You know, design, when we sat around the table, wasn't the first thing that we discussed, actually. <laughs> it was a price of eggs and, you know, a few other things. So, to my amazement, one day, my dad came to us and he said, while we are sitting around having dinner, he said, hey guys, just to let you know, we've just negotiated to buy our own house. The house that we're living in, uh, and we're going to pay it off over 20 years, but it's ours. So, do you know what we can do now? We can paint it. And so we all got so excited by this and we thought, okay, we're going to paint the house, okay. So what colours can we do it? So we all got together and we all picked colours and so we had this beautiful arrangement. I remember the living room, it was, yeah, well, I'll show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was yellow, my sister was, yeah, anyway. Every room in the house went like this. It was like, you know, somebody tripping on drugs, I tell you. So <laughs> only in retrospect do I think back on this and I just go, oh my God, how did we live here? But we were so proud of this. We were checking with bring mates out and we'll check out what we just done, you know. Anyway, funnily enough, my dad played tennis and after a little while he, he, he let me know that this guy that he met at tennis was what they call an architect. I said, oh, architect, that's not pretty interesting. What they do is, are oh, they designers? I said, okay. So, they invite us over, for some strange reason, to have sponge cake and tea. And I was so excited. I, why was I so, so excited about this fact I'm going to see this architect's house? I don't know. But when I got over there, I thought, I wonder what colours this guy's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be something else, you know. But how can he beat what we just did? <laughs> but maybe he could. And he did. <laughs> and I walked in and I went, oh my God, where's, what, what's he done here? What's going on? And I remember leaving in the car with Dad going, what's going on here? And I remember Dad turning to me and going, maybe he's a shit architect. You know, <laughs> 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 you know maybe he just you know, hasn't got it. <laughs> Can I just pause at this moment and just let you know the seamless quality. I've just introduced Austral Bricks <laughs> Second slide, and I've already got them a promo. <laughs> but I've also called it shit in the same breath, so maybe it's not as good as maybe I originally suspected. Anyway, so the next thing happened after I finished school, my mum said to me, look, I've got you an apprenticeship um, working in the nursery. You know, any job's a, a job. I don't know why we did the nursery thing, because I'd recently with my dad, concrete it over the backyard. But, you know, <laughs> never seen a plant in my life, but here we are in the nursery. And when I'm in the nursery, I had to go to, you know, oh, I had to go and do horticulture, as, as uh, Steve mentioned. And I was quite fascinated. I got in the library at, the, at the, the horticulture college and I opened up this book that changed my life. And it had Japanese gardens in it. Now, West of Sydney, i never seen anything like this. I turn the page, I look at this and I go, oh, this is another world. Wow, look what's going on there. Look at the beauty of it. And I was really quite taken through it, but I flipped through the pages. I got right to the very end. I remember this last image that I saw, and it's this one. And all of a sudden my heart went, what? What's this? I mean, where are the plants? Where's the soil? Where's the anything? I mean, this is a bit of a joke. What's going on here? I couldn't believe that anybody called this a garden. And I just went, oh, yeah, that's a bit embarrassing. Kept on turning. <laughs> Three years later, I'm in the same library. I accidentally get out the same book, turn over, see this image again. This is, sorry, actually two years later. And I'll look at it. And my heart just goes, oh, I cannot believe how it impacted on me. What happened between the start when I looked at it and thought it was absolute farce, and I'm looking at it now just totally blown away by this thing. I had to understand what was going on here. And so I started to understand all these called Zen gardens. And, and, and I read a little bit more and it, it had this thing about, you know, that Zen talked about, you know, these... I think they're known as Noah's. Anyway, they got a name for it. And uh, it was about, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? And, you know, your brain goes. 
haven't got a clue. <laughs> Could never figure it out. But I was fascinated that a garden was more than just a garden. A garden took you to an intellectual place that was far more than what I could have ever imagined. I didn't go back home to my concrete backyard and sit and meditate, but it did ask that question. <laughs> what is out there? What is out there? I had to go to Japan. I had to go and understand it. I had to go live there and I had to unravel this thing. So it was a huge journey for me to go over there. And when I was over there, I got this introduction to this. Now this is a, a beautiful kind of subset into a quick kind of freeway into, you know, short circuiting the intellectualization of what is the sound of one hand clapping. This is Daruma Sun. Maybe a few of you actually know Daruma Sun, but Daruma Sun represents uh, a Zen monk who sat for 12 years at that garden and at the end of 12 years supposedly got enlightenment. Now enlightenment's not a bad thing actually. And uh, so this guy represents him, so he's got no legs because he can't walk after 12 years and there's this <laughs> solid head just sitting there all knowing. And the bottom of the base is actually got a, a weight so that whenever you hit Daruma Sun, he bounces back up. And so you paint him one eye when you have a wish to try and improve yourself. And then every time you struggle with that, that wish, you whack Daruma son and he bounces back up, proving that no matter what life's challenges, you can come back up and you can solve things. And if you get two eyes in it, then you've solved all your problems. Well, I thought that was kind of cool. And while I was there, I got introduced to an architect. A guy said, well, if you like him, you might like this guy. And I'm sure you all know uh, this guy. And I particularly love this, this piece because um, I call it the half and half house, actually. And it's half and half because half of the house is a building and the other half is a garden. And rumour has it that Ando was asked by the client to um, give him a house and a garden on the very tight site that he's got here. And classic Ando, he goes, yeah, okay, leave it with me and come back. So he comes back after it's been built and there's his garden. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, okay, lovely house. Where's the garden? It's coming, right? He goes, no, this is the garden. And he goes, yeah, okay, I'm in a bit of trouble with that. <laughs> so he says, okay, what you do, sit here for a day and I'll come back and we'll have a chat. So he sits here for the day, comes back in the afternoon and he goes, so what do you reckon about your garden? He goes, yeah. Still not convinced. He says, okay, that shadow in the morning, where was that shadow? And where is it now? Hmm. And that leaf that's laying in the corner, was that always there? And that butterfly that's flying across the, the concrete, was that always there? No. Ah, what a beautiful garden you have. That's pretty incredible. You can think past so much in thinking of design. And this was really quite beautiful for me when I saw this. And I've always been a, a great fan of under ever since. But I was young and yeah, that was good enough for that period of time. Then I, I thought, oh, screw this, I'll, I'll go travelling. And I took about seven years just kind of travelling around the place. <coughs> I was a great surfer, surfed all over the place and really enjoyed myself. But unfortunately, in Guatemala, I met a German girl, got married and that was it, right? So <laughs> I had to get real. I had to come to terms with life as, as a mature adult male, like some of you are here. Not all of you, obviously. Um, and so I came back to study in uh, this thing that I'd heard about en route, which is called <coughs> landscape architecture. And so here I am as a young, energetic young lad. I'm the one on your left. There I am, yeah, idealistic. And funnily enough, that guy there on, the, on your left, is Adrian McGregor, who's the other partner for McGregor Coxall. So he's the McGregor to the Coxall. I would never have thought at the time, if you'd asked me the last guy I would have ever joined up in business, <laughs> he was him. But somewhere or other, you know, you marry the person sometimes you least expect, and so we did. So but when I studied, I really loved the idea in study of um, design. And, and I was fascinated by the process of design. Design, as we all know, just doesn't come. Design is not a box you open up and pull it out, it's just there. Design is a struggle, this 
this intellectualization of finding your way through to get to the answer. The answer's there already, of course. You just need to find your way through to it. But it's that struggle and that way of finding it that I find really quite beautiful. And it has kind of references to Schrodinger's thought experiment, which some of you may or not know. Does the cat die or does it live? And then I quite like the idea that, hey, you don't have to have all the colours like I had in my house. It actually, you know, you can just say, okay, let's treat it. Everything is white. After that point, I'll work with everything else. And Maya, you know, of course did that. I was particularly taken with uh, these guys because I just love the way they use materiality. And some of that obviously comes back in some of the work you'll see in and stuff, but when you see it for the first time, you just go, wow, look at the gorgeousness, the way they've used it, the massing, the whole thing about that is truly something beautiful, and a lot of the other work references, not that, but the way they use the material and how they, how they work with it. I mean, it, it can be quite poetic just because of the materiality. Again, Undo, I love the way that he just said, oh, screw it, I'll just use concrete. Not always concrete, but in the majority, concrete, but also that handrail detail, you look at Ando's work, Ando doesn't say, oh, I've got to come up with a new idea for a, a handrail. Well, there's the handrail, there's the balustrade, I always use that, that's what I do. And I, I kind of thought, well, taking out all the wheat, all the char, to get to the core issue. Sometimes we don't need all the complexity associated with it. And then, of course, Merkit and his beautiful work and obvious reference to <coughs> so much of the, that it preceded it. Now, I went to a talk once that, um, somebody gave about uh, Glenn, and they said a beautiful thing. And that beautiful thing was that every time Glenn takes up a piece of work, he hones. He's honing his craft. He's just refining. He's not looking to chuck a whole pile more things in. He's looking at understanding what he's doing and getting better and better and better at it. I've shown you all this does not necessarily mean that I've taken all this in and, and you know I've come to any of this. I stumble and bumble and are still stumbling and bumbling. But there are certain things that help you align your thinking and, and these are the kind of bits and pieces of it. Anyway, after that I, as uh, Steve said, I went worked overseas. I worked four years in England, actually worked seven years in Hong Kong. I had a, a really beautiful experience in, in Hong Kong. I, I actually worked with Bob Nation in Hong Kong <laughs> in a couple of projects. And I have uh, a lasting memory of a, a, a late afternoon on one project we worked. And I'd shown Bob this, what I thought was an incredibly beautiful piece of work. And uh, Bob sat there and he twisted his moustache and he had that little glint in his eye, I don't know if you know Bob, but if you get around later on you'll see he's got this glint in his <laughs> eye, right? He didn't have to say it with shit, <laughs> but just by the way that he communicated, <laughs> I knew <laughs> that was garbage, you know? And I understand it because at that stage I was going through this bizarre period of, I wanted to be a punk landscape architect, picture that, right? I wanted to, I wanted to get out there and I wanted to be, look at me, you know, I can do great shit. <laughs> and Bob just simply solved the problem. He actually took me out later on, got me drunk and said, Phil, hey, look, it's all okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I kind of then collapsed after, not after Bob, but after seven years of working there, doing a whole pile of stuff. The great thing about Hong Kong was we built, we screwed up, we learnt, we moved on, we kept on building and I got a lot out of that. But at the end of seven years, I kind of gave it up and I, I don't know, I didn't think I had it anymore. And I thought, perhaps the best thing for me is just to go back to very <laughs> simple <laughs> meditative thing. And I got a long mowing business and a ute, and I just kind of mowed the lawns. And I <laughs> mowed it nice and straight. <laughs> and very and it was beautiful existence, you know, for probably two years. And then one day, Adrian McGregor, who you've seen previously, called me up and he said, Hey, Phil, uh, how would you like to go on a design competition? End of my life. That was it. <laughs> we went and we did some crazy bloody idea, you know, where ALS go and show them what we can do. We lost, of course. Um, <laughs> the next one we did, we were a lot more conservative and we actually won it. And so started this, this vortex where you get sucked in. I, I was on the, like at the edge of a black hole. I didn't want to get sucked in. 
I was going to not get involved in this, I was going to say, but, but gradually design sucked me in. And so we started doing a couple of a little projects. Uh, this is uh, Atlas Apartments, part of the design we won for Green Square. And obviously you can see my sad Japanese reference in there. Um, <laughs> And then another small apartment uh, that we did. But it, we kind of got our, our start. And we sort of got a grounding. And then one day, um, I'm just checking the time so I don't run. But we live in Manly, right? We had a small office in Manly. And uh, I'm walking down the street with Adrian one day. And he goes, oh, see those guys over there? That's them. They're the guys who won that New York competition, you know? <laughs> and it was John Choi. He'll show you that and brag about it later so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but it was one, one of those kind of things, you know, where, oh, wow. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> and John, I think, waved once. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I now call him Choi Boy. <laughs> Got no respect for the guy. Um, <laughs> But, but what happened was, uh, Adrian set it up, he, he said, look, you ought to go home and talk to John, we're going to try and have a go at this Parramatta Road competition. Um, Saturday morning, why don't you go over and, and see what you can do? I can't make it, but John, John will be there. And I never met the guy except waving from a distance. And we sat down and probably in 15 minutes, we had, we had this, we, we cracked this baby, you know. We came up with this idea that, you know, the complexity of Parramatta Road, you might not know it, but a very complex fit of Sydney could be solved if we just understood the forces at work and use those forces at work to create, a, to create a great outcome. So we came up with Urban Judo. And from that point, we basically have worked together off and on over a number of years. We also were in court for three years over this, which was um, part of the, the success of winning a design comp in Sydney sometimes. That's the joy that you get. Um, but we, we, we establish a, a great working relationship. In some cases, uh, we lead. In some cases, John leads. So I'm going to show you a couple of projects where we have led. John will probably show you, I think only one, because he's only got one to show. Um, <laughs> he's going to show you one project of the one that he uh, did with us. But it's the beauty of, and we talked a little bit about it before, Steve, that there is a relationship now between architecture landscape architecture, urban design, that the, the barriers are blurring and that we all have a role to come together to make this the best possible outcome. The releasing of, the, of this kind of like ego and coming together collectively to create this. The hardest thing is that when you sit down for the first time, the ego being broken down, that sense of I'm really good, how good are you kind of thing, you know, you're in the landscape, oh, I'm, I'm going to show, you know. You need to get past that point so you can have the dialogue and you can challenge one another at the same intellectual level and really draw from one another's strengths. And so it's an honour to be talking here tonight with John about um, you know, where we've taken it but also where the profession can go as a result of it. So I'm going to show you essentially four projects um, that possibly are some of our major ones, sorry, the first one is, um, is actually two projects, I'm sorry, I'll go back, but they're kind of connected, if I can, will that take me back, no way, okay, so there's two that are kind of sister projects, sorry, thank you, you thanks, Steve. so they're kind of two sister projects, I'm sure you'll recognise Sydney uh, Harbour Bridge, the Opera House, those two green things you probably kind of can see are two projects. There are two um, all storage facilities that were built uh, in Sydney during and just before the Second World War. They now become redundant, and so being transferred both of them to parks, likely for us. So the VP Park is the first one that we did. Now there's a great story here, and I like stories. That's why the whole thing's called Designer Story. Uh, I totally underbid on this. Didn't have a clue what what it would cost us to do it, and so I won it. <laughs> 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 so, 
there was not an inkling that I was the right guy for the job at all. It was North Sydney Council and they want the cheapest bastard they could find and I was it. <laughs> but it worked out perfectly for us because it set the groundwork for the next bit of work that we got. Anyway, should I be pointing somewhere in particular or I just keep, keep pressing this? Oh, oh, yeah. There we go. So you might have seen this one, Dallas Point. Uh, when we got on the project, they had no money. They had aspirations, but they totally ran out of money. So the idea here is, also it goes back to my roots a little bit. The idea of using very cheap materials. The materials that I had had around me as a kid, the cricket nets, the, 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 um, the chain link fencing of the cricket nets, galvanising, all those things were something that I was very familiar with. And I wanted to try and see how you could put that and reframe it so that people might see it as something other, something beautiful. So how can you put a material that you normally expect to be, you know, like shit of Western suburbs, it's crap, it'll always be crap. Maybe things can be better than that if you look at it, look at it in a different way and explore how you can detail it. And that was the challenge that we tried to do here. So you're going to have to pick again. So you can see the extent of the chain link fence and, and gal, and this is probably one of the first times that you know, significant amount of work had been done, Gal, in that the frontline marine environment. Should I point? Sorry, should I point this there over there? Should I? Uh, Under the cupboards. Oh, right. cupboards. The cupboards. There we go. <laughs> and there's a little bit of a dialogue here because this is the start of something that ultimately then leads itself. I mean, you can see clearly the the Napa Valley with Herzog and the the interest in in Gavian. Uh, this is just a little bit of an infill to a, to a wall that was broken down that we infilled, but it led to other things later on. But just the, the composition that we're working with there. So yes, sorry. Over there. Thank you. So <laughs> that, that will help. So we'll quickly go to BP, and BP was. Um, was a project that, that we got on the back of that. Luckily enough, I got um, this one because we did pretty good job VP, and they kind of said, oh, okay. We weren't the cheapest this time, so that was kind of good as well. But the story here is that how could we build this, inc this facility, which used to be an oil storage and grease manufacturing plant in such an incredible location in Sydney Harbour, the last promontory after the Opera House that was left to be developed. So it was a great honour to work on it. But the idea is, well, how can we talk about what this represents in terms of change? Well, the change for me was that one culture built this oil refinery storage plant, or storage plant. This next one wants to build a park. So we've now come to understand that this is a very important piece of land. And so we didn't want to destroy other landscapes in the re rebuilding of this park. So when I first went out there, I saw all the buildings, all the structures, all the things that were there. I thought, maybe we could break all this down and use it to rebuild the park, rather than going out and cutting sandstone and all the new materials that you normally expect. So that led to the whole dialogue of what uh, Ballast Point is about, and the cradle to cradle idea, and uh, technology. It's and perfect. Someone's fiddling with the mouse. <coughs> Sorry, my clock has gone ham Don't worry, just go. No, no, Sorry. Just talk. I don't, so, <laughs> I don't, don't want to run Don't distract yourself, just Okay. Go. So, this is just what we did, everything we did. We picked up every piece and we said, okay, how can this be used recycle? Concrete. We used broke, recycled aggregate in the concrete. We used um, kiln ash from power stations as part of the cement component to it. We looked at uh, rebuilding all the walls using broken rubble material, all the timber recycled, uh, all the plant material provenant stock, so seed collected from the local area. The soil came out of skips that was being collected around Balmain and taken to a recycle centre. Um, just the panels for the structures, all taken from the metalwork around the site itself. So the question, once, it, once that design story is embedded, it answers everything that you do. So Everything has to line up with that, that philosophy. And it drove something that I thought was really quite beautiful at the end of the day. A very complex site, but um, ultimately, and it's grown significantly since then, but um, a quite a beautiful outcome, I think. And I have to give John credit here because um, 
this is the, the entry building that we worked on together. And I remember uh, I went home in the weekend and I, I was saying to John, it has to be recycled, we have to work with materials, how do we work with these materials? And I had this great idea over the weekend that I get these sticks and kind of, re you know, as, a, as a roof cover. And I was kind of really excited come racing, John, hey, got this sticks idea, mate, check this out, you know. And John very quietly, as he always does, lets me go through what I do. And he said, I actually had an idea. I'm like, what? You had an idea? What? <laughs> And he said, what about if we use recycled seatbelt straps? And we use kind of this idea of um, the, the surfboard <coughs> leg straps, you know, the Velcro things to tighten them up. And we actually found a guy that was selling seatbelts that had failed the safety test. And so they had to get rid of it. And we found, oh, this is really gorgeous, you know, some uh, community groups that needed to, that could dye and, and change the colour. So we've, the dye represents, the colour represents the Balmain tigers, the stripes obviously have all that indication of the tigers, blah, blah. But it worked out so beautifully and the simple composition is really something very proud of. And it flows right the way through the park. I'll be very quick on this. But the detailing, I have to tell you, I did the detailing on the timber, but John did the detailing on the door, and they line up perfectly because we worked <laughs> so closely together. And I kept saying, John, don't forget that. Yeah, yeah, Phil, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the, uh, the tank 101, largest tank that used to store uh, oil on site. And it was the idea of, well, okay, if renewal's taking place, let's take fossil fuel and turn it into renewable energy. So what used to contain uh, fossil fuel is now wind turbines and turning and creating the energy for the site. And all those panels around there are taken from the old tank and recycled and, and reused in a different way. I'll just accelerate now. Sorry. Yeah, anyway, you, you get the idea, you get the sense of keeping the old, inserting the new, the tanks, the walls. This is, uh, I, I'm particularly proud of this little piece where we just cut down, in keeping with the whole recycle idea, we slice down that wall and the bit that we slice down, we just fold over and lay down as the pathway. So nothing, nothing wasted. But just, I don't know, like the composition, the, the sandstone, the old sandstone and the concrete. I think that's quite nice to even know, but that's me. <laughs> the walls, I'll finish off on the walls because I think the walls are quite beautiful. You know, can you imagine going to a client who originally expected Sydney sandstone, which you can see a bit up there already, uh, and it'd be all cut sandstone, and then going along with a bag of broken rubble bricks and concrete. By the way, it's brick. <laughs> <laughs> broken, unfortunately. But there's a, there's a, there's a long-term use for brick at every level. Um, so, you know, the idea that this would be building, built on the edge of Sydney Harbour, you know, this, this was a radical thing. You are only as good as your client. And this client, once they bought into this whole story, logically followed us through and said, well, yeah, I can see what you're going to do. But I really like it textually from a distance. It also solves all graffiti problems because people don't do that. And then as you get closer, you see there's a detail, there's a, there's a control to those edges. And then ultimately, this is the last shot for it, there's an upfront quality about the elements that are embedded in it, just so you know. That's my 21st birthday mug <laughs> <laughs> that my dad gave me. I didn't tell him I put it in there, but um, so it's that layering that I really quite like about the project. So just quickly, I, I want to finish on just a couple of projects that are. Uh, uh, this one's a kind of uh, a project that we did in Berlin, and and again it's that, that idea of a, a story driving it. So this is Templehof Airport in Berlin. Um, the idea here is they didn't have a lot of money, so they wanted to try and come up with a, a quick solution how they could solve the problem. There's a building at the back there that you, you may see, but this was not built by Speer, but it was built by in Hitler's time, and the idea that, um, that international travel would be a major factor in the future of the world. So to give Hitler credit, I mean, he's a visionary. He saw the future, and this was it. So, but it run its course. You can see the runway there. This runway and this runway. And so basically all we tried to do is just keep everything as much as possible. And so the outer edge is these pop, these are birches that we, that kind of completed the arc of the building. 
that building had a half heart. We just completed that arc, and the idea was that each person from around the world would buy one of those trees, plant it, and that would save them a lot of money, but it would also be a symbolic gesture of this coming together after the war. And then the remainder was that the internal area would be kept. The interesting thing is Hof in German means, a or Hof means a protected area. And so the idea that this central area will be protected and retained as it was. Okay, I'm pointing, I'm doing, yeah, there we go. So you can see the internal area inside the uh, <coughs> tree, uh, the birch trees and just the wildness of it, just keeping it very wild, the connection through. Um, we dug out a little bit of a scraping because the water off table was extremely high and the idea that water could be introduced as part of that element, the runway is kept for their own integral, you know, interesting qualities. And then the soil that we dug out for the uh, wetland or for the water area, we made a hill and that became a place for, I think, young people to do raves or things of that nature. Um, can I, can I, Get this next one. one I'm going to do very quickly but this is a project that uh, John and I did together and it's for a I don't want to dampen the mood but it's for a cemetery does that dampen the mood no. yeah a little bit um, so it's in Western Sydney and uh, this client came to us and said look I want to do a uh, Muslim burial cemetery a Muslim cemetery I uh, got this great idea I want to uh, clear all the land put Lebanese pine trees all the way around a road with uh, three roundabouts, and I want you to design the roundabouts. I want, <laughs> I want water features, and I want swans, and I. And he was looking at me, hoping that I get more and more excited by the minute. And I was okay. But the funny thing was actually beautiful landscape, Cumberland Plain, which I don't know if you know, very important in Sydney. And so I came back with a suggestion to him that absolutely changed the, the, the positioning of it. And, and it kind of took its, its precedence from the idea of the Arabic uh, walled cities. And so it set up a structure in the, uh, the landscape where we had, I'm sorry, I think I, no, I've got it right. Um, so I'll take you in the sequence through it. So you start out and you walk through the landscape. <laughs> Uh, in this elevated walkway, a chance to kind of just engage with the whole uh, burial process. It gradually leads up to this walled city that you enter, which is reminiscent of the one I showed you. And then once you pass through that wall, the, the idea, I'm fascinated with the idea of landscape in Australia. We struggle very much with the idea of native versus non-native. You know, if you plant non-native, then it's, it's not of our ken. And I'm always interested in that because I'm a white boy, you know, I'm not Australian in the truest blah blah, you know. So anyway, so this internal area is like crossing into that other world and so everything changes once you're in the other world, it's all exotics, it's kind of Shangri-La type experience, so the, the experience of possibly going to heaven, if you will. I haven't actually used the most recent drawing stone as you well know, but it is a brick. <laughs> I'm hoping to pick up an extra few bucks doing this, John. Just letting it out there. Um, so anyway, so the idea that the central piece is becomes uh, a kind of other, other space, and then the internal area would also allow for burial of uh, interment of ashes, and then the ultimate area where you would actually bury the people out in the um, in the natural area. The idea was that there would be no headstones, that the memorialisation would be the re retention of the landscape itself. And so that leads into a natural burial system which is kind of being used around Europe to a certain extent uh, at the present moment, <coughs> growing. But it's the idea that the memorialisation is in the saving of the landscape. And so 
ultimately that was the objective, to keep that quality what it was. Last one, I'll finish off. So Glenorchy uh, Sculpture Park is part of Mona. I know Tasmania, I don't know if any of you have been there. Quite a beautiful project. This is an extension to it. So Mona is up there. <coughs> and we have been tasked to do a design for entrance to Mona via a sculpture walk that would then arc itself around and back to Mona. So we work with uh, Room 11 on this one. And um, you can see the kind of arcing connection back to the, uh, the Mona <coughs> building. And then as we get closer, the design was really about a, a box entry building that uh, West, uh, sorry, that uh, Room 11 were doing. It was an old uh, point of call for uh, barges that used to come into this area anyway. So it had a, a kind of concrete surround to it and pad. And <coughs> so we tried to work with that. And, um, so we added in this wall and this containment, very, very, very harsh landscape, howling winds in winter, bitterly cold, really a very intense landscape. And so what we tried to do is actually as little landscape as possible and let nature take its course. And so this is the entry to it, the wall, the simple grass is coming back. This is the building, uh, west, uh, sorry, room 11 <coughs> building with the, the simple glass. The, the plants low, just grasslands, respecting the concrete pad as much as possible, what was already there. Uh, it ultimately became quite a very successful uh, gathering place. And uh, when the, uh, I think the cumbrias uh, started flowering, really quite spectacular, but that wasn't what I was after. What I was really after was this. And it was about the simplicity in a lot of ways, it, and this is the last slide so I can relax. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a lot about the finding of the nothingness, the, the, the retreat of the design as much as possible. How little can you put in and it still work? Maybe it goes back a little bit to the idea of what's the sound of one hand clapping. Maybe, you know. But as my father, the fitter and turner, in the factory, we would have said, maybe it's just bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>